Ooh, look, a Fram oil filter. Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is a dual circuit brake master cylinder. Currently under the hood of a 1965 Plymouth Barracuda where it does not belong. In the beginning, and I'm talking way, way back, there were cable actuated brakes. These generally would have been a drum type brake, not at all unlike these, that were mechanically actuated by a cable. Now this cable might have been attached to a brake pedal, or it might have been attached to a lever, depending on the design of the vehicle we're talking about. And then came the advent of hydraulic brakes. While they had been invented in the late 1800s in Germany, they finally caught on in America in the Duesenberg in 1920. Ford, America's major automaker at the time, was reluctant to adopt the hydraulic or juice brakes, as they were known colloquially, until 1939, which is incredible. I don't know when Chrysler adopted this system, but when they did, it would have been very similar to the system found in this Studebaker from 1949, which is leaking inside now. Anyway, notice the pedals that go through the floor. The master cylinder for the brakes is located here. Slightly inconvenient. In the mid-50s, Chrysler and the other automakers migrated the master cylinder from underneath the floor to here on the firewall using a set of swinging pedals under the dash, and there it has remained ever since. Whether under the floor or under the hood, the master cylinders in this time were always single cylinders. What you could call a single pot, or what we enthusiasts love to call the pump and pray. This system uses one large cylinder, one line, and a distribution block that goes to all four brakes. It's a simple, robust, and very reliable system, at least until you spring a leak anywhere. Because if any of your four brake cylinders lets some fluid out, well, all of a sudden, your pedal's gonna go all the way down to the floor, and you're gonna have a bad time. Now, I don't know who invented the dual circuit master cylinder system, and I don't know necessarily what year it was first used. I do know that Studebaker and AMC adopted this technology early. AMC may have been the first to do so, in America at least. I do know that this 1964 Chevy Bel Air still has a single master. Whether equipped with disc or drum brakes, or power or manual brakes, Chrysler adopted this technology across the board for 1967. I'm pretty sure they actually had to because of National Highway Traffic Safety Administration requirements, but I could be wrong. There are several different versions of the dual circuit master cylinder used in this time. Most of them look a lot like this. You've got a split reservoir here, and then a front and rear line running down to the hydraulic system. Note, for whatever reason, the front brakes are always in the back on Chrysler's. I suppose I shouldn't say things like, always. It's pretty easy to tell when you have disc brakes, the larger reservoir is going to be for the front. Later in the 70s, Chrysler developed this, an aluminum two-bolt master cylinder with a plastic fluid reservoir. And something a lot like that was used for decades. Now upgrading from the pump and pray, the single master cylinder, to a dual circuit is not at all a new idea. People have been doing this for years. We're currently under the hood of my 1966 Coronet station wagon, where we find a dual system. It's also attached to a brake booster, and there's an aftermarket type portioning valve there as well. This is a really good setup. Why does this thing get nastier and nastier under the hood every time I look? Hey OSHA, is this safe? As with our wagon, if you've got a 66 and older vehicle and your master cylinder looks like this, you know, horrible and nasty, and there's fluid pouring out of the back of it, then you need to replace that. And while you're at it, upgrading to the dual circuit setup is a great idea. And that brings us back to Dave's Barracuda here. Here we have what I think is a 1967 style drum brake master. Obviously this has a bolt on lid much like the pump and pray did, but it's a split reservoir and it's got the dual lines to come down. Now we're lucky on this project because right next to it, we've currently got Dylan's Dart Sport. This car is getting converted to a modern style booster and master and prop valve, just like what we've got on the wagon. So the original lines off the master and the splitter valve down here, which is different for the dual circuit setup, is all available. So now it's going on the Barracuda. Now I say splitter valve, and with the original single pot master cylinder, that's all this is. Pressure comes in and then it goes out to all four wheels. Of course, the rears only use one line that goes back there, so it's one in and three outs on the block. But there's nothing else happening in here. It's a simple piece of brass. On the dual circuit system, this block is actually a safety valve as well. There's a shuttle valve in the middle there, and if there's ever a pressure loss at the front or the rear brakes, that shuttle valve will move upward or downward when it senses a pressure differential, and it'll close off the offending circuit. At the same time, it'll trip the warning switch over here, and that's what that wire is for. That goes up to the brake warning in the dash. This particular valve happens to be under my 69 charger, which explains why it's so crusty and horrible. 
but the technology is exactly the same on any four-wheel drum brake car. Speaking of which, we would love to upgrade these drum brakes. This thing has four-wheel, nine-inch drums, which is not amazing by any means. Unfortunately, it's not really in the budget right now. The good news is this thing has a manual transmission, which is kind of like having a second set of brakes. If you happen to be performing a disc brake swap at the same time, then instead of the drum brake type valve, you're going to want to use a combination valve for a disc brake application. Of course, they didn't bother with that when they put discs on my 68 Charger. I need to remove this drum brake unit at some point. I've driven this car thousands of miles and I've never had any issues with that. But in a panic stop situation, what can happen is the rear brakes will lock up before the front brakes and then you can go sliding around, which is not particularly fun. Someday I'll do a big disc brake swap guide, but today is not that day. As I've explained, there's a big advantage to having that shuttle valve under there in the event of pressure loss, but you don't actually need it. If say your rear brakes spring a leak and all of that fluid disappears, the pedal is going to have excessive travel, but the front brake should still work, even with all of the fluid in the other side gone. The pedal will not be as good as it would have if that shuttle valve was in place though. A simple way of plumbing the disc swap is instead of getting the other type of valve, you leave the factory splitter from the drum brakes in place, you take the rear brake connection off of it, you plug the port it used to go to. Then you take the line off of the master cylinder for the rears and you go straight to that, except between the two, you install one of those hand adjustable proportioning valves. That way, you can turn down the pressure going to the rear brakes and prevent that lockup issue I was talking about. Again, in this case, you do not have the shuttle valve or the opportunity to hook up a brake warning light to inform you of any issues, but you do still have the redundancy of the dual circuit master cylinder. The real beauty of this setup, again, is we just kind of had these parts. So it's a very cheap swap. It just takes a brand new master cylinder and these, let's say good condition, used lines. Now, because we took them off of a late A body and had to put them on an early A body, things are a little bit different. Alan did have to bend these lines to get them around the Z bar. We had to extend them somewhat, which meant opening up the loops here at the top. But in general, it was an easy enough swap to do. I'm gonna try and get this a little farther from the exhaust. Here's a look at the shiny new used splitter in place. You can see the rear line goes here. It's on the other side of the block from the rear line going up to the master cylinder. And up on the top is the feed from the master cylinder and then the two feeds that go out to the left and right front. Now these did have to be rearranged somewhat. You can see the right front had to kind of come back here, dodge around some things and be reshaped a little bit. Also notice the brass inverted flare adapters. We had to adapt these 316s lines to the larger threads that would be for a quarter inch line. These are easy to get at any parts store. Now I mentioned it's possible to have a brake warning light with this setup, but uh, we won't be wiring that in this particular car. If the pedal gets soft, that's gonna be a clue that there's something wrong. Now we had every intention of putting fresh brake hoses and wheel cylinders on this car all the way around. Rather unfortunately, the parts that Rock Auto sent us are kind of sort of the wrong ones. And they kind of sort of got here like some weeks back so we can no longer return them. The good news is these rubber hoses are not original and none of them are horribly dry rotted, cracked up or anything like that. They're all flowing fluid nicely and I think we are fine just leaving these in service. Uh, we're not fine leaving this starter wire on the exhaust manifold. I think we'll go ahead and fix that. Anyway, David actually already bled these brakes. It had a very firm pedal. They felt pretty good, although it did pull to one side or the other when braking hard. I don't remember which one. Hopefully we've got that sorted with a little adjustment and we should be able to get some really nicely working brakes on this thing. None of the wheel cylinders leak now. So yeah, hopefully we're good. Now I'm certainly not one to throw away good factory pieces. I actually need this splitter valve for the garbage can CUDA. Because I'm a total weirdo, I'm doing a reverse disc brake swap on this car. I put 10 inch drums back on the front and I'm installing a factory single pump master cylinder in the engine compartment so that my fender well headers fit correctly. All right, that's still kind of gross. So we're gonna go ahead and keep bleeding this for a bit. David actually bled three out of the four wheel cylinders on this thing before it ever got here. This driver front is the one that he didn't, which is why there's still a bunch of rust and horrible stuff in there. While I was off wasting time, Alan bled all the brakes and put the wheels back on. Now we've got it on the ground and we're gonna check the pedal. Ah, we got a bubble somewhere. There is a pedal, but it's pretty soft. Also note, this is a manual brake car and we did have to put the push rod from the old master into the back of this one. 
Thankfully, it did come with a new rubber sealy thing that goes on the end of the push rod. They don't always have that. So now that we've got some pressure in here, we just kind of step on the pedal and it should lock the push rod into the master. That way, there's no danger of it pulling out of the back and suddenly losing all brakes. Well, I think we're just gonna give pedal bleeding a try. This thing's being kind of stubborn here. It smells like brake fluid for some reason. I think we found the air bubble. Hey, it feels way better now. Yep, fixed forever. There was a little bubble in the front left and a big bubble in the front right. Time for a test drive. Hey, remind me to tighten the belt. That's kind of annoying, actually. Now, if we, and by we, I mean Alan, did our job correctly, this thing will now break straight. Let's find out. Okay, ever so slight pull to the right there, but overall, not bad. It does still tend to wander a little bit right because rum brakes. It's not bad, it's certainly not violent, not whipping the wheel out of your hands or anything, but it's a little less than perfect. I'm thinking we get some more miles on it, let the brakes wear themselves in, and we'll see what we get then. So there you go. We've got working happy four-wheel drum brakes in Dave's car with some extra safety. We've got a whole lot more to do on this thing before we can send it down the road. For example, an entire rear axle, possibly new rear leaf springs, and four shocks. Of course, that does mean we kind of have to take these rear brakes back apart and bleed them again, but Alan doesn't seem concerned. Oh, we're also going to annoy some purists and install a flip-top gas cap. Kind of looking forward to that. This thing's shaping up to be a pretty awesome daily driver, and I, for one, am looking forward to having it finished. Anyway, hopefully that was useful or something. If you do have any questions about this, feel free to drop them in the comments. Until then, as ever, thanks for watching. And remember, it's not how fast you go, it's how fast you stop. Okay, unrelated to anything, when I turn the parking brake off, they're still dragging. We're gonna be changing the whole rear end in this thing, so we'll adjust the cable then. It's always something.